All right, Bismillah ar uh, First of all, thank you, uh, Talat and the organizing committee of uh, Shalimar uh, Surgical Symposium for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, surgical decision making. Uh, I think uh, wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. We all know that surgical decision making is so important because as surgeons, we are making life and death decisions. So an expertise in surgical decision making is very important. And my message is that it can be learned and it should be taught to the, to the uh, budding surgeons or upcoming surgeons. So uh, this is a very common uh, real life scenarios uh, when a surgeon is faced by the two uh, aliostomy or a repair of uh, um, in in a, in uh, in a trial and injury or uh, uh, whether to do a primary anastomosis uh, or to divert it or not to divert it or whether to continue with the definite operation or a damage control. So such scenarios are very common, and uh, they need uh, deliberation. And uh, the decision making is not only based on. Uh, what would be the ultimate advantage to the patient uh, to his life, but also what's the time and resources available and, uh, and the expertise uh, uh, at hand. So first of all, I'll talk about uh, the general decision making. What is the uh, uh, non-medical literature says about uh, decision making? So what is a decision? What is the, why the knowledge of decision making is important? What are the types of decision which we make generally? And how do you make decision in surgery? and uh, especially how to uh, avoid pitfalls, especially in making such decisions. So what is a decision? Decision is actually uh, given a situation, your choice about the course of action. And uh, two important things uh, we need to remember that you choose an action when you have, you know, when you have calculated uh, risk, you, you know the underlying risk. For example, you, you go and buy a car and you also buy insurance for it. And you know that you have to pay a uh, 5% premium per annum for, for that car. And uh, there are chances uh, that uh, this premium, uh, uh, you don't get any accident and your premium, uh, you, you pay probably for five years, 5% 5 per annum. And, uh, and you know that there is a calculated risk in it. But uncertainty is the situation when you do not know uh, the outcome. For example, whether the marriage is going to work or not, uh, nobody can predict about this. And surgeons are most of the time in a situation where they have do not have uh, enough data to predict, and that's why they 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 work in su such situation of uncertainty. Now we make decisions either strategic or tactical. The tactical decisions are uh, day to day decisions, and the strategic decisions are long term decisions. Uh, uh, and similarly, uh, we make decisions which are time bound and sometimes a non time bound. A time bound, like you have to decide uh, whether you will join this uh, offer or not. Uh, and uh, uh, then emotional uh, versus rational uh, decision making. There is a beautiful book uh, by Stephen uh, Pinker recently with the name of Rationality. Um, he said that uh, humans, uh, despite being very smart, uh, uh, they still make dumb decisions, uh, despite the fact that we have logic and clinical reasoning, uh, critical reasoning and uh, probability and everything available, but still uh, we do not make decisions rationally. Uh, instead, uh, we, we, we make more uh, emotional decisions. And lastly, uh, the types of decisions are intuitive versus analytical and I uh, advise uh, all of you to basically read uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow book, and which has beautifully described uh, that how intuitive mind is more likely to uh, make uh, mistakes uh, and have uh, uh, underlying biases uh, and uh, as compared to the analytical mind, which takes a little time, but ultimately solves a problem. So decision making theory uh, is very popular in management science and uh, the father of that decision-making theory is Herbert Simon, who basically designed three basic principles for decision-making. The first one is the intelligence activity where you gather all the relevant information before you make a decision. And then uh, the design activity in which you uh, ponder about all the alternatives available and uh, you analyze those available. And the last one is a choice activity in which you select one course of action. 
Similarly, Peter Drucker, uh, another management guy from Harvard, uh, basically devised again similar things. So define a problem, then gather uh, as much uh, information as possible about that from uh, at that problem, then uh, formulate and consider alternatives and uh, avoid potential pitfalls while considering alternatives, and lastly. Uh, decide on a solution and take action. So these are the general decision-making steps uh, advised by the guru of the management. Then whenever you take SWOT analysis, uh, especially for strategic decision-making or long-term decision-making, uh, like uh, career uh, change or, 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 uh, or whether you go up, do a, some job at uh, certain places or you're going to uh, shift your practice so these are such decisions which we need uh, SWOT analysis and that stands for strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. And many people uh, use it for the benefit. It's a very useful tool. And uh, mind you, uh, the quality of uh, such decisions uh, basically is directly proportional to the time needed. So uh, the more time you have, uh, the better would be the decision. And that's why you see many of the bureaucrats will hold the file for longer period of time so that they, they collect more data, they have develop more thinking, and a robust uh, action can be taking place. Now, how to avoid errors in decision making? Uh, this is something we all want to know. So uh, for general decision making, uh, non-surgical decision making, uh, Dr. Uh, this Daniel Bernoulli, who basically was famous for his uh, fluid dynamics studies, uh, he's a Swiss mathematician and in 18th century, he devised this formula that if you want to avoid bad decision, the expected value of the decision is equal to the odds of gain in, into the value of the gain. And uh, all the errors in decision making are either because of underestimation or overestimation of odds of gain or underestimation or overestimation of the value of the gain, right? So I just to give you an example, that if there is a lottery and uh, you have a toss for head and tail and the, the price of the lottery is $4 and the, uh, the gain is $10. So if you see from this, the odds of the gain is 50%, or one over two, and the value of the gain is $10. So one over two into value of gain is 10 is about $5. So by spending uh, $4, uh, the the gain is still higher than the five dollars. So, uh, if you want to avoid uh, uh, decision making in error, this is basically uh, in relation to the to the gambling or the or the or the or the uh, other field. But uh, primarily, uh, most of the mistakes uh, done in general decision makings are either the overestimations or underestimation of the odds of the gain or under our overestimation of the value of the gain. So this is about surgical decision, about the non-surgical decision making. Now let's a little bit talk about, after understanding the general decision making, let's talk about the surgical decision making. So primarily the surgical decision making is uh, a two-step approach. First of all, the situational assessment or in which you uh, gather data and uh, do uh, understanding and, uh, and then projection of that data and then take a course of action. So, this surgical decision is dependent on uh, the data, how, how, how good the data is and how well it is communicated. Obviously, how much time you have and what is the underlying risk involved to the patient and what are the resources you have, especially technology uh, is, uh, latest technology is, uh, is a great tool for, for help in better decision making. Then your own motivation, willpower, and then your own experience and expertise, then ability to visualize things means your own vision and decision making skills. So surgical decision making is a lot of de lot dependent on uh, these things, but more importantly, the data and the expertise. Now there are three strategies which surgeons use to make a decision. So one is analytical, the other is uh, rule based or protocol based, and third one is, uh, in is intuitive. So as you grow in your surgery uh, experience, uh, initially when you are novice, you use more of an analytical approach where you uh, would collect the data and interpret the data. Whereas when you are a little bit competent at the level of uh, R4 or, or senior registrar, then uh, you mostly follow what the book says or the guidelines says. And uh, 
once you become an expert after years of experience, you start choosing this pattern recognition and then you have the ability to handle the uncertainty. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, the ex this is the approach uh, used by most of the expert surgeons. But in naturalistic decision making, especially in emergency, uh, you use a fourth approach, which is a creative approach, because sometimes uh, you, even your patterns, you have not seen the previous pattern of similar thing. So use a fourth approach. So once you do an ongoing situational assessment and make a decision, your decisions are four types. One is intuitive, which we already talked about. The other second is rule-based. And the third is analytical. And the fourth is creative one. So as a surgeon, you also need to know that there, is, there might be scenarios which we have not encountered before. And you should be ready to like devise a new strategy. And uh, this, this is another field which we need to think about. So the important thing is whatever decision you make in surgery, the most important thing is having a situational assessment or awareness. And what do you mean by situational awareness? There are three things involved in situational awareness. Number one is perception. Now, perception can only happen if you are paying attention. So distraction has to be avoided, especially intraoperative. So all sources of distraction has to be minimized so that you can perceive the input. The second is once the input is inside, you have to understand the meaning of that input or data. And then the projection, because projection is what you are going to do with that. And uh, this, uh, this is important non-technical skills and Royal College Services or DEMBRA has devised a, is a, an important non-technical uh, skill course for surgeons just to understand uh, this uh, decision-making and situational awareness. Now, we have already, uh, many support system working for, for helping the novice and uh, competent surgeon and to standardize the surgical decision making and in the form of guidelines, protocols, clinical pathways, algorithms, and checklists. In fact, even the uh, scientific mind, the sci psychologist recommends that if you want to avoid pitfalls in decision making, especially in surgical decision making, you need to follow the checklist and the algorithm because algorithm uh, will probably help you avoid the biases or uh, mistakes which, you, we, which we commit. Now, intraoperative decision making is a very, very uh, tough uh, uh, job and uh, there are multiple things going um, simultaneously. Uh, supposedly you're doing an pupil operation and uh, the cognitive co uh, continuum is, is from intuition to analytical. So, there are two things going simultaneously, the intuitive things and analytical things. So the data is coming while you are operating and you are interpreting the data, but at the same time, you're also uh, using the pattern recognition from your previous uh, uh, experience. And then you are modifying that and trying to understand the situation. And obviously the CN maker is independent on what environment you are in and what time and resources you have. And this situational awareness, this leads to uh, monitoring of the progress and projecting forward. And uh, what are the different steps which you are going to take? So sometimes you have to finish the Whipple, close the Whipple because you cannot proceed with, on with it uh, based on what is understand. So if your patient starts bleeding, right? So your pattern recognition is that if I continue with this operation, the patient might lose uh, uh, life. So you you uh, abruptly uh, decide that we're not going to uh, continue with it. We're just going to pack and we'll, we'll, we'll come back. So surgical uh, decision making uh, during operations, especially the complex operation, uh, has multiple uh, decision making strategies going on. And as a surgeon, we need to know, uh, know that as well. Now, after the surgical decision making, which is done by the surgeon, let's come to the decision making, which is shared and usually it is done by the patient. The surgeon's job is to basically help this patient make the decision. So supposedly a person comes to you and she says that her sister is, uh, had a, had a uh, CA breast uh, when she was uh, 40 years and now she's also 40 years and uh, she wants to do a mammogram. So she has come to you and she wants to, know whether she should undergo 
uh, mammogram or not. So as a surgeon, you have to tell what is the evidence, how helpful is the mammogram? So this evidence comes from an expert judgment. What is the sensitivity and specificity of the mammogram? And what is the positive predictive value of a positive uh, mammogram and stuff like that? So you have to present that information uh, analyzed by an expert, right? And ideally you should be an expert or somebody who is an expert in this analysis. And then you present this uh, in the form of uh, evidence, which is uh, digestible or understandable by the patient. And now the decision has to be made by the patient. So there is one objective part, which is, uh, which is done by a medical expert or a statistician, if you are not a statistician. And the second part, which is the preference part, the choice of what course of action uh, the, 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 that he will be taken is to be done by the patient, right? So our job is to make the evidence as digestible and as accurate as possible, but let the patient decide about what action uh, he has to take. So that's the reason the shared decision-making should be based on outcomes that are important for the patients and they should be accurately interpreted. And if you do not know the statistics, uh, you must refer it to somebody who understands the statistics about that uh, evidence which you are presenting and let the patient decide. And obviously there are few patients who probably would not be able to, to decide, but whosoever is the next of kin, he has to make the decision about what life exists. Sometimes the people, uh, decide beforehand, uh, especially their end of life decision, that they do not, de they, they said that if they have something happen to, to them, please do not resuscitate. So there are many uh, end of life decisions which pa patients already make and you have to respect those decisions. Uh, somebody comes to you for a mastectomy and despite that the evidence is that the mastectomy and the wide local exchange has the same uh, survival, uh, it is the patient choice which you have to uh, which, which you have to respect. So after giving you three different uh, scenarios, one it was a general decision-making as advised by the gurus of management. The other one was a surgical decision-making done by the surgeon. And third one was the patient making the choices. So we discussed three types of decision-making here. So decision-making in surgery involves both objective and subjective steps like situational assessment, taking course of action. And the most important determinants of decision makings are time, risk, and expertise. Bad decision making results mostly from errors in assessing the odds or the value of the game. And lastly, the shared decision making should be based on outcomes that are important to the patients, and they are, must be based on accurate, accurately assessed evidence, and they should reflect the actual patient preference and not the surgeon's one. I hope that I was able to uh, make this decision making process a little simpler so that you call or you can all understand thank you very much for your patient listening